Hi, Yara. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Oh, okay. I'm not sure what happened. I just pushed some random buttons and then started working. Good. You should play the lottery today. <laughs> really? I really should. That's a good idea. So um, thank you for joining Instagrammers um, to my live experiment of um, interviewing and having conversations with people I really admire, my friends that have special talents. So that would be you, Yaro. Ooh. <laughs> I'm excited. This is, I think, the fourth time that I've done it. And Yaro Rotskoff is, in my judgment, um, thoughtful and articulate and sensational and human, very human and very present being. And so I really appreciate that about you, Yaro. Thanks, Lori. I've never heard you say all that. It's nice to hear. Um, let's see. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Oh, I see. I put my pods on and they're like just very Uh oh, I just lost you. So, um, Yaro is um, a Pilates practitioner and a woodworker and woodworking teacher. And I just love that combination. We've had just really brief moments in the studio um, talking about being a woodworking teacher. And I find that we always get like kind of excited when we have our moments um, between exercises and Pilates. So let me ask you, Yaro, um, what, what brought you to Pilates in the first place? How did you find it? Like, uh, kind of like I find most things. I never have like a big grand idea to go do something. I just sort of stumble into it. And we actually, my, my, we have a very close family friend who passed away suddenly. And I was, at the time I was working a lot, like, you know, 80 hours a week or something. And just a little out of balance, I'd say. And my brother, uh, who could afford it at the time, uh, much more than me, just said, you should try this Pilates thing. And, you know, I just needed a way to like, claw back some healthy activity in my life. And so I tried it. And I, I am, and that was, I don't know, must be like 12 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And I loved how uh, there was this cerebral aspect to it where, you know, if you're a curious person, it just sort of goes on forever. And, um, and that was great. I, you know, I have kind of an active mind and I, um, it's always kind of spinning and, and that would, that would consume me in a way that was healthy and happy. Unlike running where it's like, I want to stop. I want to stop. I want to stop. <laughs> With me, every step is like, why, why, why? <laughs> I don't like running either. Maybe, um, maybe it's my flexible nature that it kind of like the shock like doesn't absorb properly, and then it jangles my brain around. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it's a li like lizard brain or something where you're like, this isn't. <laughs> you're gonna end up in peril. Get out. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think sometimes when we get the routine, so you've been practicing for 12 years. And uh, I think even in Pilates, when we get into when the routine gets so strong, like it happens a lot on the reformer, when we get on and we have it such a routine that a similar thing kind of happens. Um, or it can happen uh, in my experience if we don't keep reinventing the work mm -hmm. or reinventing um, our relationship to the exercises and the apparatus it can get mm -hmm. kind of like lizardy and uh, mechanical mechanical yeah you're going through sort of the patterns of movement but not kind of finding the going to a, kind of an edge or a piece of work that's helpful. Yeah. Wow. I guess. So how mm -hmm. did you um, f 
figure that out, Yarrow? Like, did someone, did one of your teachers tell you, or did you, did you come to the studio with that mindset of using the work for yourself? And how, how did that happen? I, mean, I think that it was just this, I was more open to doing it. I've never been athletic, and so in a way, and I'm I'm more heavy set, and so like walking into a Pilates studio would never have happened if I wouldn't have been kind of like emotionally taxed with this like you know family loss, you know, sort of like willing to accept help and you know because Pilates studios can often not always certainly but often be filled with dancers or you know I always feel like you know there's a bunch of skinny minis and. Um, and they're wonderful and so inviting and, and I have found great partnerships there. But from the outside, it would be intimidating to do that, you know, it was. And so it wasn't really a quest to like, I don't know, I was just sort of open to it. And, you know, my, my lovely brother was, you know, so generous in his offer. And so it, it just made sense. And mm -hmm. I found myself there. It wasn't wasn't a grand idea. I wish I was someone who had like, you know, I, I have this great idea. I'm going to go do that. Like I sort of, um, I like to think gracefully fumble my way through new things, but I, that's, I sort of, they find me more than I find mm. them and I'm responsive to them when they show up, yeah. but I don't go seek them out as much. Right. Yeah, that's kind of how what happened to me with Pilates in in general. Like, people always want to know when when did you meet your teacher, and basically when was the big bang that that was like Pilates for life. And for me, I think it was like fumbling my way, and every time I tripped and I looked up, like there was Pilates. And I even tried to get away. Like I went to physical therapy school and I tried to get away. And then I was like, oh, there's Pilates again. Woodworking is sort of the same way for me. I um, had been in a, I'd been doing a job for 20 years and for probably, that was very demanding and largely behind a computer and I never envisioned myself doing, working in a cubicle and I was in a, in a lot. And um, my husband and I had this dream to go spend a year living on a piece of property that my brother owns where there's a shop and we're actually there now. Which oh, is okay. I've been, I wanted, I'm circling around to how was it the wood, yarrow yeah. wood. Okay, it's coming together. And I'm sort of a busybody. Um, I come unraveled in about three weeks if I don't have something really meaty to, to work on. And um, so we were out here for a few weeks at one point and, or maybe two weeks even, probably wasn't even that long. And I just start to kind of get antsy. And so my brother, my, sorry, my, um, husband and I had this dream like, well, you know, what if we spent a year out at, you know, your brother's cabin? And I was like, that sounds magical and amazing. And what am I going to do? <laughs> Can I make jam? Um, and That's a yeah, lot of jam. <laughs> a lot of jam. So um, yeah, I just found that I would sort of come unraveled out here. And, um, but my brother is a woodworker. He's multi-talented um, and he's a beautiful wood shop here. Oh, I didn't know that. I know yeah. he's beer, right? Are you going to start making beer too, Yara? I'm not, no. <laughs> That's it's not. Maybe. Wood. Right, yeah. Wood calls you. Yeah, and I don't love beer, so. <laughs> uh, but I've always wanted to be able to build something and I, you know, really didn't, wasn't handy at all, but I do like to tinker with things. So it felt like feasible. And so I, um, when we went back to Seattle after being here for a while, I, uh, and three years of trying to get out of work and get out, I could uh, make that big decision. I did. And 
was like, wow, three weeks in. And I'm like, well, now what do I do? And I stumbled on a woodworking school in, in Seattle, um, it's called the Wood Technology Center. And it's beautiful and very affordable and has um, multi -pro multiple programs. And one is a furniture and architectural woodworking program. Mm -hmm. It's just under two years and uh, you get a cabinet making degree. And um, I applied and with much persistence was accepted. Uh -huh. and, um, oh, what does that mean, much persistence? Well, um, they have a two-year wait list, and oh. at the time, wow, they, yeah, two years yeah, for this one program. They have a cab uh, cabinetry program that's very, um, yeah, it's it's got a huge wait list, and then they also have a boat making program and a carpentry program, oh. which you can get into more quickly. Uh, and the instructors are amazing, but this program, the specific program that I wanted to do. Um, was difficult to get into quickly. There's just lots of folks that want to do it. Wow. It just so happened that I was lucky enough to land there when um, a, a program who saved slots for women had opened up. And um, and so I, I showed up every day and proved, you know, hi, <laughs> hi again. Yeah, that's good. And finally, I don't know if they were like, Ugh, get this lady away from us and get her in the program or. Um, she really you know, wants to do it. Yeah, she re she's proven that she wants to do it. Yeah. And so I got accepted and, and it was amazing and I loved it. And, um, and then they needed, and then they had these evening programs and one of them was a woodworking for women course. And the class, the, the instructor left. Mm. And within about eight days, they needed a new instructor. Oh, so. oh, great. Okay, because that's another one of my questions is first Yarrow in the wood and then Yarrow teaching. So you're teaching women. Yes. To work with the, in the shop. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah an opportunity that it fumbled into your field. Fumbled in, yeah, no doubt. And what made you pick it up? Pick up the fumble and go with it? Uh, I guess I was intrigued enough. And I mean, I was terrified. I was really only about six months into my experience, a little bit less even. And I you know, was sort of looking around like feeling like a total imposter, mm. but I was also intrigued enough. You know, I could tell that even though it was scary, it wasn't like, you know, fly this airplane scary. It was like, Hmm, that's interesting. And right. these folks that have been doing the, the job for 30 years all believed in me. And they said, when they asked us who could do this job, everyone said, Yarrow can do this. And wow. Yeah, so I that gave me confidence. You know, I wasn't necessarily confident in myself, but I believed so much in them, and they were confident in me that I just borrowed that confidence from them. Oh, wow. And I felt that is similar to my um, becoming a Pilates teacher also. Like, I didn't seek out, I want to be a teacher. I just was tinkering with this weird method of Pilates that no one knew anything about. And then my friend said, hey, do you want to teach this person, these people? And I was like, wow, there's nothing like teaching and having a student look at you, right? For you to like pull your shit together. Oh my God, it is. And there's a couple crashes and burns right in there and you know, some tears and you know, but that's, you kind of, when it's happening, you're like, oh man, I'm learning a lot right now. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but I'm learning a ton about what works and what doesn't. And I'm going to go home, do my homework and I'm going to come back and do a better job. Yeah. I find yeah. it just fascinating. The topic of learn when you're wearing your teacher hat 
how to stay open to learning mm. because I just find that really fascinating. Um, because in some ways it seems like, well, if you're going to be a teacher, you should know everything. But there's a kind of a closed mindedness to think you could ever know everything about anything. Oh yeah. And I mean, I always try to remind myself, you really just need to know just enough more than who you're teaching. Exactly. To offer value, you know, exactly. and, um, and there's a lot of, I think you and I kind of touch on this in, in class. Um, you know, it's, I really noticed it would not at first, but I really noticed as a student of yours, when you were trying to kind of manipulate me and get me to do something and I it wouldn't catch. And then you try another angle and, and there's, there's such a similarity. I started to pay attention as I was learning to teach, as watching you teach and gleaning what I could. And I realized there were so many parallels though. The medium is so different mm -hmm. you know, the muscle memory and fear and some embarrassment in front of, you know, for the student at times in front of other students or just, you know, cause in the shot, in the wood shop, teaching someone, there's a lot of fear. And I think that there's some fear for students in bodies as well. Um, mm -hmm. Self image or just actually, you know, scared to go upside down on your hands on the, when you're, you know, using the wonder chair, or, you know, that was mine. Mm -hmm. um, and trying to figure out how to give the student just enough to feel confident, be safe, mm -hmm. to be able to kind of take the step to open up the next opportunity for the next step. Right, and have an experience. And then the experience is the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was going to ask you, how has Pilates helped woodworking? But I think it's the opposite. How has teaching woodworking affected your Pilates practice? You've already started down that road. Like being a teacher, now you're a teacher of woodworking, and so you're working with other people, and you're giving them suggestions. Yeah. I mean, one thing is, is um, that is sometimes difficult to balance because everyone is different in how they receive touch, but touch is a big one where, uh, and just really, I, I notice it in Pilates as a student, so I can kind of put myself in my, in my student's head a little bit mm -hmm. in, in watching how when I reach out my hand, just even in somebody's periphery, they see it and it has a big effect on them. Mm -hmm. So I started to notice that when, you know, when someone in the studio would move, it would make me move, even if they weren't intentionally trying to make me move. Just, um, I think I described, uh, you know, how it, it's good if you can stand as a tree when you're observing someone, if you can stand as a tree and not make your leaves move because every little finger move or head turn or body adjustment that you're doing just when you're observing someone is actually being heard by the student and seen by the student. And it affects people. It does. And so I started to be very careful about how I moved my body when I was teaching someone, particularly when they were you know, on a saw and they needed 99% of their attention on what they were doing, but they needed that 1% on me in case something dangerous started. Right. And I would start to use that just a little bit as a cue. You know, I, I realized that they could see me and I would, if I saw that their hand wasn't moving properly, I could move my hand in the correct way, just as a gesture and it would make them, and they would, they would mimic it. That's like that mirroring and reflecting um, that we mirror each other and we reflect each other. And that's a big way that people connect. Yes. That's really cool. You know, that makes me think of the going up front on the Wanda chair 
and you in particular, but, but everybody is like this when we're going up or when we're trying to balance, especially doing something difficult, like going up and down on the chair. If there's like a nervous Nelly apprentice standing there, not like a tree and with all the leaves waving, it's really distracting and dangerous. Yes. And it's interesting, I just thought of this, but I think that I even work with your apprentices by like, I will, <laughs> I will do like the Jedi mind trick and move <laughs> them with my hand out of my view because I lose balance when their hands follow me. Yeah. Even though the intention, I know the intention is like to help and, help, and yeah. many, I think maybe that is help. I, I don't know. I'm not in their body, so I can't say, but um, sometimes I will Jedi mind trick their like whoosh and move, move them away and they respond to that. I think it ah. goes both ways sort of. And, you know, it's always a little tender because you're like, oh, I don't want to give you, I want to make sure it's not negative um, and that you can, you know, accept this <laughs> trick of mine and then apply it and use it. Um, but yeah, that happens. I just thought of that. Yeah, I love that. So you have been training apprentices for like 12 years. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. We have a clientele at Atlas Pilates that of um, awesome clients that are doing their work. And as each group of apprentices, and for us, our apprenticeship program is very small maybe one or up to three people at a time training. But as these groups of apprentices go through the clients, people like Yarrow and our clients for many years are part of that training program where you guys get to see, Oh, there's a new batch. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Lots of Jedi, lots of Jedi <laughs> swiping. And then as they improve, hopefully they're adding they're actually adding value. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And, and it creates, I think what's cool about the apprentice piece is that I feel, I don't know, it's like I feel joy when they are achieving and learning and you see their progression and they see your progr progression. It's, it has this like team kind of environment, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. yeah. Conversation, again, it's, it's a conversation between student and client and then client and apprentice. So there, the apprentices are like observing, but it goes two ways. And I love that you, you can move your woodworking student's hand by moving your hand. Mm -hmm. And um, Gosh, I could talk to you all day. It's so interesting. And I love the, there's even more parallels than I thought. Yeah. We I think that you would be fascinated to see me teach. <gasps> you I could be an observer. Yeah. You could come observe sometime. And I think it's awesome. interesting. You would be like, oh, I see what she's doing. She's moving her hand in the periphery to get this other hand to move. It's like this, uh, you know, puppetry going on. Yeah. yeah. I love that. And, um, and I love the, well, I don't love that. I want to say I love the danger, but I want to say that I'm guessing that you're teaching people to work with scary, you know, hammers and nails and saws and such. So you don't want your your students jumping. You need right. to keep like calm situation there. Yes, and I occasionally I'll need to move swiftly, um, and I do have an ability but the difference. Like you can move swift and focused is much different than swift and yes, dangling. Right, you want to you know if you jolt then they will jolt. And yeah. it's like on an apparatus, like you don't want them to jolt out of there, but you want to get there quickly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, exactly right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Very with simple. the practice, I teach my students like 
a way to keep your body in one place and start to move your legs away from you or um, so you can kind of like be going in two directions at the same time. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. And I think it's probably similar for you where students may see a demonstration and be like, yep, yeah, I got that. And then they go to try to do it on their own and they're like, ugh. I guess I wasn't paying attention or it just, you know, I thought I had it and now I try to do it and I have, there's no muscle memory yet. And um, that's really interesting. So, you know. How do you know when they get it? Or how do you know the difference between not getting it and getting it? Is it only the performance of the skill or is there, is there anything else? Yeah, I think it's the performance of the skill and, and, I definitely have a lot of activities that my students do in the beginning that are, um, that give me a lot of opportunity to see who each person is. Mm -hmm. Does, um, does turning on a machine scare the bejesus out of them and they shrink back or do they gas it? You know, like I think, you know, when my grandma really shouldn't have been driving anymore, she got confused and what would she do not slow down she wasn't that slow driver she'd oh, be like pass it oh my god <laughs> yeah and and some students are that way and so learning who each one is so that you know kind of how to counter what they're doing both in instruction and um how close you need to be to them to make sure that they slow down what do you call that like what do you call somebody that responds is there a word for a, a, a backup responder as opposed to a forward responder? I don't know. I guess just off the cuff, I'm, I'm guessing that it has a little bit to do with the, you know, fight, like zoom or flight, get okay. out of there, you know? Or free. Yeah, yeah, right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like a sympathetic and Paris, the nervous system sort of thing. I would imagine that it's, it's that. I mean, I... I see when people gas it, I would much rather people went slow, but also to not retreat. Um, it's not intuitive. I think when you, when something goes wrong or you, you're, you're wondering, you're getting this message, is something wrong? Is something wrong? I think it's, it's really common to take action. And in woodworking, it's better if you slow down. You know, if you stop pushing a board through the cutter, it won't cut anymore. But that it's very hard to just to freeze like that. That is not what students typically do in my world. They're like, oh, I'm not doing it right. I need to do the opposite of what I was doing. Right. And that often introdu introduce more danger than just downshifting to, you know, below gear one and just letting them cut. Uh, letting the machine sort of spin in a space without going forward or backward. Yeah, that's very similar to working with the body. Like a sudden, if you're moving rapidly and then you move and you stop, that's very jolting. That's very different than yeah. Yeah, ratcheting down like that. Slowly. Yep. Cool. Yarrow. Yeah, you'll have to come observe sometime and I think you'd get a kick out of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, let's see. And how, how is it working with women? Or do you have anything to say about working with women in woodworking? I do. I didn't used to. And I think what has been really interesting for me is, um, you know, I just sort of fell into this and uh, because uh, the class is open to anyone who would like to join, we definitely have, we have men join from time to oh, time. I know that. Um, okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, people self-select and I, you know, don't want to, you know, filter anyone out of the course that feels that that's the right place for them. And, uh, but I had this really interesting quarter uh, about a year and a half ago where um a gentleman joined with his wife in support of his wife and it was lovely. Um, but it was problematic for another, uh, a, a woman in the, 
in the class who felt, you know, this is really a space that was intended to be created for women and, you know, how dare you sort of was uh, the response. And that was a little tricky for me to manage. Um, but what I noticed is that in the course of the class, the, the wife of this student, once given the opportunity to work on her own, she really blossomed. Um, and what, you know, I went and got some advice from another instructor in advance. And the advice that I got was women tend to, not always, but there is a tendency, particularly in the shop, that if um, gentlemen are present, that there is a deferring to them. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't notice that. And I hadn't noticed that in, prior. Um, and only because That's the, the contrast of having a man actually there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really, so I, I the the advice and what I did was to really proactively call on women uh, to make sure that, you know, they were carrying the big sheets of plywood and really right. ensuring that it didn't fall into any stereotypical roles, um, just you know, we're all kind of imprinted in a way. And so I did that. And what was so interesting is that the woman who uh, joined the class with her husband ended up kind of doing a career change by the end. She was very timid in the beginning and by the end had completely blossomed. Mm -hmm. Her, you know, normal life, I don't, I'm not exactly sure what that was, mm -hmm. and joined the full-time program. And really blossomed and is still in the program, still a, a strong woodworker. And, um, and I think that her husband who had been very, um, very instructional and kind of leading the conversation with whenever there was a, a moment where, you know, we would do a group exercise, he would sort of lead that exercise. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I brought, I split them up. And she just blossomed. Wow. And I think that he also learned a little bit about making space for, for women, particularly in a shop. And I, and then the woman who really had taken exception to him being there, I think by the end had noticed this change. Mm -hmm. And I think by the end, everyone really felt like that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I have really had a lot of women talk about how thankful you sort of don't know how it's going until the very last night of class. Uh -huh. And then there's just this outpouring of emotion. Right. And, um, I've had a number of women say that they wouldn't have taken the class if, you know, if men were in there, that they've had um, experiences in their life that made that feel less safe for them. Or um, you know, some are worried about mansplaining and, um, and it's just been, you know, I didn't gravitate to teach this specific class because it was women and it has been such a gift for me mm -hmm. to help kind of them unlock something that they might not have done. Mm -hmm. Certainly some women that are in the class just take it because the time slot's convenient and don't really care that it's a class for women. The camaraderie in there has been really amazing and, um, it's been an exceptional opportunity mm -hmm. And I, I fell into it, fumbled into it, and glad I did. Oh, great. You know, that reminds me, like, Pilates is, there's a lot of women in my world. And when there's a man in the group or in the class, there's a similar kind of maybe pressure or deferment or there's something about moving the apparatus around when there's a man present. So I always, uh, and right now I have a student, well, of course not during the pandemic, but I have a student who's particularly, you know, got big, strong arms. And I, but with all the men, I always say, you know, you are not required to move apparatus. When we say, can we get help moving the reformer to the other side? You're not required to be one of those people. I just want you to know. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, it's like a thing that we it is a thing. kind of roles. Yeah. 
And in my world, and I don't know about in your world, I'm interested to hear you, but in my world, certainly there are moments when strength is helpful, but I also find that it's nice. It's, it's not the primary thing. It's much more how you navigate and manipulate the piece of wood over how strong you are and how quickly you can push it through a machine. Yeah. And it's really important no matter who you are uh, it, to, you need to check the ego a little bit or else that overconfidence is just such a hindrance. Yeah. Um, yeah. So one of my questions is how is wood like a person? Word like a person is word like a person i don't know i mean i think it has such personality that you don't know and and you know you learn pretty quickly um that you know it's it's fragile depending on what you, you know it's it you know you don't think of wood as being fragile and then it really really is particularly uh depending on which way you're pushing it and i guess that could be similar to people uh -huh. You know, super strong and yet super fragile in these other ways. Uh -huh. And yeah. What do you think wood is like a person? <laughs> do you well, know? I was just thinking of like that we're organic. Mm, yeah. And you know how like the that speed, that kind of speed photography that shows something growing that in super slow motion there's trees right there they're perfectly still but in that kind of speed photography uh -huh. plants moving uh -huh. i love that yeah that's interesting that um i mean wood definitely moves as you cut wood it doesn't just you know adhere to the shape that you just put it into it will particularly over time kind of you know it'll it'll grow and shrink based on climate but well, it may also return to a curve or something that that original tree knew about. And it has a mind of its own, just yeah. like my clients. Yes. <laughs> so no matter what we do to push and pull our clients, <laughs> they have a mind and they have their own grain and they have their own memories and their own physical history. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Except me, of course. I'm I'm just clay, and you just mold. Me. You're just clay. That, yeah. That's one thing I tell my um, students, and like, my I'm an artist, and my clay people are my clay, and then they walk around with my masterpiece, and who knows what they're doing with my masterpiece? They're just out there living. <laughs> so I think maybe my. Um, well, not last question, but I wanted to hear about your trio, what it's like to be in your trio with your in Friday trio when we're in the studio. Oh, I love my Friday trio. I miss them so much. Um, I love that trio because I feel like the three of us are so different. Um, we're similar, more similar in age than sometimes a trio might be, but um, I think that our bodies are really different and we're, we're curious about each other and kind of what the other person is doing and working on over there. Um, but we don't get absorbed by it in a way that's distracting. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, uh, you know, Becky's working on her stuff. Bridget's working on her stuff. Carl's working on her stuff. Um, and we're really tolerant of it because sometimes it's, you know, sometimes when your instructor disappears for a while, you know, maybe you feel lost or something, but I think in there we have just the right, the, the, whatever the secret sauce is, we have it to really be able to stay engaged in our own exercise and be tolerant of whatever the other person needs from a, a focus perspective with the instructor and we're all kind of learning and pushing and encouraging each other. And it's, it's so great. It's such a, you guys have, we have like a, it's an energetic kind of connection to me that I see between the three of you and then me in there. Um, because it's not like your chatty friends. It's not like a fun friend workout. Where, right. Where you're, you know, you're just like, Hey, how's it going? How's it going? What, what's going on in your life? No. 
like in a way, I think you guys, if you had T, you would be really surprised. Like, oh, is that, I didn't know your last name. Yeah, I don't know any of the last names. <laughs> I didn't know you were married or you like, you don't know the most basic things about one another. Yet when you're working out, you really know each other. There's something in the, in the um, secret sauce. Yeah, that you, you allow space for each other and you acknowledge each other and you inspire each other without like really getting into each other's business at all. It's true. Yeah. We, we, what we know about each other is how it takes us out of the studio. Like if somebody's going to be gone, or somebody's back from a vacation and, you know, is sorting stuff out about getting back to the studio or yeah, it's really kind of about the time that we spend there together. We're, we're all very present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, and you are all, like you just drop into your work. Like maybe that's part of it is that you, your pillars, when you each drop into your work, you're there, you're kind of holding space for each other to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. like, and we're very curious, but not in a way to escape the, the, the work. Sometimes, you know, you can be, you can get so caught up in the why, 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 instead of, you know, maybe ask one why and then go do it and see if something resonates. You know, you'll get answers by doing it yeah. rather than just asking. Or it. Yeah. And I think we're all a little curious, but also just want to try this stuff out and see what we learn. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing yeah. about initiate, like my conversation with Teresa um, was about initiating clients and what that means and, I guess kind of teaching people what, ha this is what happens here at Atlas Pilates. This is what you can get. This is how to ask a question. This is when to hold your question and just do it. And that's a very interesting topic that I think that you have, um, figured out and that you in particular and you with your trio have really figured out a way to follow directions, get a workout, make it your own, mm -hmm. learn something, your critical piece of work that, you, or I would say your lately I've been saying, what's your area of interest? Or I've been saying, this is my area of interest and this is what you're going to do today. And then, but then it, it, either way, the conversation happens. Right. One of us starts with more a stronger agenda and then we converse through the work, the footwork, the hundred, the short spine, like that. I think that you and Teresa have this grace uh, that you're able to teach without lecturing it, which is sort of, um, there's this friendliness, but you're also able to coax the group back to the work without it feeling like a jolt. You know, you're not, you know, because sometimes students are, and it's part, part of the group is, you know, I don't know if, they, if they're just not up for the workout or they're just, you know, their head is somewhere else, but they're sort of using distract uh, some like questions or something as a distraction mm -hmm. unintentionally I think. Mm -hmm. and and both you and Teresa ha are really talented at being able to bring the group back and also if there's one person in some group who sort of is doing their other thing is to well you know I tried to coax you you're uncoaxable yeah. I'm going to let you be over there, but I'm going to stay on, on track with this other yeah. group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And you do that gracefully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure I've been that other person before and just let to, to go without feeling like I messed you up or something so that I can come back to the studio and feel like I can do it again. Yeah. 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 I think it's like when I was a younger teacher, um, definitely needed to be in charge. I needed to be much more in charge. 
and now I, I'm able to have my teacher hat on much lighter. When I mm -hmm. first started, I felt like <laughs> I'm going to hammer this hat on <laughs> right. and I'm going to make sure that all my students obey because if this gets, you know, it's not, it's going to be, ah. right. But uh, now I'm able to put my teacher hat on lightly and say, well, and connect. It, it allows me to connect more and help a person have a real, have their experience. Because um, you can't make someone do something. They, you, you have to figure out a way to get them to take that step. You know, putting out the breadcrumbs and getting them there. And... Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes if you put the breadcrumbs like too far apart, then we'll, we'll get lost. And vice versa, if they're too close together, then like someone... For instance, I was teaching somebody in Texas and I wanted her to do this flip upside down thing. And I, I said, well, move your right foot, move your left foot, move your right hand, move your left hand. And I thought she was like, something was wrong with her. And then finally I said, well, just go upside down. And she was like a gymnast. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, I guess that was me. I guess I have a problem. <laughs> So yeah, just balancing. Well, it must be hard. You just don't know if somebody's going to be able to do that yet, and then they do, and you're like, "Wow, well, okay." Well. Yeah, you have no idea, and especially well, like we have twelve years step by step. But um, yeah, when you start a new class, right. and you have how big are your woodworking classes? How many people are in there? Sixteen students. Oh, okay, so that's like pretty many to. You try to just find out the the ones on the furthest ends of the spectrum first. Yeah, it's my fastest four hours every week. You know. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, ooh, that was a whirlwind. <laughs> yeah, and does everybody still have all their digits? Yes, I luckily I um, never lost a digit. No, I I would say that I. Um, I talk about margin of safety often, and uh, I I really am quite careful. And in fact, I'm sure that you know other woodworkers that um, see my pace. My pace is not very quick. You know, it's not a fast pace. And um, but I also really just am fine with that. I would much rather go at a slower pace and go the extra mile, create a margin of safety. On, on on walking out in as good a condition as I walked in. And right. I've always felt like if somebody was injured in my class in a in a serious way, that it just might really change my relationship to teaching. And I feel and the classes that I teach are with students who are have day jobs. They're coming in at five PM and they, you know, they're beat. They, they, or they've been taking care, care of kids all day. And, you know, they, they're, they're coming kind of hungry. It's at the dinner hour. Mm -hmm. And so it's super important to me. And, you know, what they learned in this past week, they, you know, forgot half of it by the time they come back in. So it's, you know, I need to revisit that muscle memory and try to, you know, make sure that we're, we're doing things in such a safe way that when they leave and they try something on their own, that those that they have tenants that, yeah. Yeah. So important to me. I think it would be a real game changer for me if mm -hmm. uh, someone severely injured themselves and it's yeah. quite a risk on, you know, we teach all the big equipment. Right. Mm -hmm. well, I'll just, yeah. I'll observe in the corner. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it gets your attention for sure. Yeah, you're like, wow, this is the real stuff. You know, I I hear that often. Wow, we're gonna use this. I'm like yeah. we. Are. <laughs> so if somebody wants to contact you, if somebody, I guess they have to live in Seattle, who is interested in woodworking, what do they do? Sure. Yeah, uh, well, you can search on the Seattle Central uh, College website. There's a way to. Um, you know, it's pretty easy to navigate your way through uh, looking for an employee that's there. And 
Um, so you can search by first name and last name mm -hmm. and send me an email there. You'd get my contact info. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Yaro. Um, so better than even I imagined um, mm -hmm. being with you today. So thank you so much for mm -hmm. joining. Thanks and, for having me. Yeah. Instagram TV. Nice. Great. Yeah. I'll see you soon. Thank okay. you. Thanks, Yaro. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Instagrammers. Mm -hmm.